Welcome back to our AN Awareness Week 2021 webinar series. We are here this evening for two presentations, which will run, run one right after the other. So if you are interested in attending both, you can just stay in the webinar or continue to watch on Facebook. Um, if you want to attend one but not the other, you can join and leave as you wish. Uh, the link works the same um, for both sessions. Um, again, we want to thank Mayo Clinic for a great slate of presentations. Our first one tonight is called Hearing Preservation Surgery, and we're excited to welcome Dr. Colin Driscoll, who's an otolaryngologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and Dr. Jamie Van Gumpel, who is a neurosurgeon at Mayo Clinic in Phoenix. Thank you both for being here. Um, I want to, I'll have you tell us a little bit more about your work with acoustic neuroma patients in just a moment. First, I'd like to let um, everyone know how things are going to work today and how the presentations will run. So all of our attendees are muted. You're only able to listen. If you have questions throughout the presentation, you can ask them in the questions box if you're attending uh, the webinar, and that is located in your toolbox, toolbar. If you're on Facebook, you can just um, write your questions in the comments. We're monitoring those as well. There should be captions running at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see them, you can just click the captions button in your toolbar if you're on the webinar. If you're watching on Facebook, they should be active. You might have to activate them in your settings if you don't see them. Um, we are recording this presentation and we'll house it on the ANA Aware or AN Awareness Week landing page that's on our website. Um, it'll be in the presentation section. So um, we'll also keep it on our Facebook page. It will be available there immediately um, after now and then immediately after it's over. Um, it'll also be on our website. There's lots of ways to get involved with AN Awareness Week this week. Just visit www.anausa.org. We have a slider on our homepage. You can click that and that'll take you to the landing page, which will tell you everything you wanted to know or want to know about um, Awareness Week, including the presentation schedule for all of our presentations this week. Um, again, once we're done with this presentation, if you want to stay for the Ask, Ask the Docs um, session, just sit tight while we welcome our other doctors and we'll move right into that. Um, Dr. Driscoll and Dr. Van Gumpel, welcome and thank you for being here today. Please um, tell us a little bit about your work with uh, vestibular schwannoma patients at Mayo Clinic. Well, thanks, uh, Melissa. I, I know it's a pleasure for both of us to join the ANA group tonight and uh, talk about one of our, our main passions, and that is uh, taking care of people with vestibular schwannomas and trying to sort out this, this disorder and what the right thing to do is at the right time. I, I'll just make one correction to the intros. Um, Dr. Van Gumpel wishes he was in Phoenix all winter, <laughs> but he actually is in Rochester, Minnesota all winter right alongside so us. Sorry. No, it's where he wants to be, I'm sure. Um, but I uh, and just, you know, others, uh, we, we have a whole bunch of uh, things this week and uh, at the risk of being repetitive, um, we're very much a team practice. Uh, we uh, are often most days in clinic together, seeing patients together, often actually simultaneously together. And we, we work uh, quite seamlessly as a team of uh, neurosurgeons and otolaryngologists. Um, and it's fun for us, it's exciting for us, and we think it results in uh, better care for patients. So I'll let Dr. Van Gumpel introduce himself. Uh, Melissa, re I really appreciate you having us all here this week, and this is an awesome event, and I think the patients and ourselves are going to uh, benefit a lot from just, you know, talking about this and uh, echoing what Dr. Driscoll said is, um, you know, I, this is a team sport. And I think most of the people taking care of these nowadays are convinced that uh, doing these in teams that are used to each other and work together frequently is really helpful. I agree. Well, again, thank you both for being here, Dr. Van Gumpel. I'm very sorry for <laughs> putting okay. you place, but um, we can, let's jump right into um, some, some questions that we've gotten from patients. Um, we don't have any currently, but if um, patients, if you have some, go ahead and start asking them. Um, but I have a couple that I'd gotten previously. So um, one question that we get from patients a lot is if you go into um, surgery for, and you lose your hearing, is it possible to regain that hearing following surgery? I'll let you feel that one, Colin. Yeah. So <laughs> hearing, uh, the reason most people show up 
and recognize that they have a vestibular schwannoma is, is because of hearing loss. And so it's pretty much top of mind, I think, for, for everybody. And we spend a lot of our time talking about the hearing loss people have and realistic expectations. Um, and one of the, the things that, it, it, you know, we often want out of medicine, we want to get better. We come in with a problem and we expect the medical team to help us resolve that problem. We can go back to our life. Turns out we can't get people's hearing back once it's lost. And so that's always, I think, a huge disappointment. And it's disappointing to us that we, we don't have that to offer. I think if, you, if we go to surgery and uh, we're unable to preserve the hearing, it's not going to come back later. So mm -hmm. yeah, basically what you have in the hospital is, is where you're going to be if you're lucky to hang on to it. There are some people that will have better hearing in the hospital that deteriorates even some over time. But I, I don't believe I've ever seen the opposite where you leave the hospital at one level and it gradually gets better. Mm -hmm. Now, other sessions will talk about, well, what do we do if you lose your hearing and what are right. the options for hearing restoration? And I, I think equally to what Dr. Driscoll's saying is patients will also commonly ask if they come in with some poor hearing up front, um, you know, will surgery improve my hearing? And we also don't see that. Unfortunately, that's the disadvantage sometimes of watching tumors is that we see people have a gradual drift and loss of hearing. And unfortunately, we're not able to save anything more than what we see coming into surgery. Yeah, so that's one of the really hard decisions, right? Um, as people c come in, it's, you know, it's typically a smallish tumor and the hearing's pretty good, not normal, but it's pretty good. Do we take the chance up front to try to preserve hearing or do we go through a period of observation with the possibility that maybe hearing gets worse? And so that, that's one of the real conundrums, right? We hear that question a lot. So is that something that um, that is on a case by case basis? What are the factors that go into sort of determining that? Do you how do you decide whether to observe or just um, go ahead and try and save what hearing is there? I mean, I, I think that's the most common upfront question we're faced, right? So one of the other talks in the series I've noticed this week is the wait and scan approach, which is mm -hmm. what most people choose to do, um, and I. And I know at least at where we're at, when we talk to patients, we say, listen, you know, at least in the short term, your best chance of saving hearing is to, is to not do anything with this tumor, especially with really good hearing in a small tumor if it's under 1.5 centimeters. But the truth and reality is that typically hearing will be lost over time if you have a vestibular schwannoma on that side. That doesn't mean both ears are going to lose hearing, just that, sing that singular side. And that's what we talk to patients. Most commonly, they choose to continue to observe because of the risks of losing hearing up front. We say, well, you know, you may have hearing for five years, for two years, for 10 years. We don't know exactly, but we know doing surgery rolls dice in which, you know, we may lose uh, that hearing on that day and you may lose five, 10 years of hearing, but you also may save it. And if the tumor doesn't come back, if we're able to save it, there's a good chance that you'll save it long term too. By yeah, long term, kind of, we, oh, go ahead, Dr. Driscoll. Go yeah, ahead. it's kind of going for the home run. So if you, if you want hearing in the next five years, the best thing to do is nothing. If you want hearing in 25 years, that's, that's good, then maybe you take the chance. But that it's a very much an individual case-by-case -case decision. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's not an easy answer to it. Uh, yeah. And because we, one of the, the things that I think we all find very, very disheartening is we can't predict who we're going to win in. And so, and we're surgeons, we want a perfect outcome every single sure. time we go to the operating room. And, you know, that's, that's winning 100% of the time. Well, if hearing preservation rates are when it's very favorable in the 70% range, that means 30% of the time we're, we're not winning. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and we can't predict. You know, we can we can make pretty good guesses about this one's going to be easier, this one's going to be harder. You know, there's, we're we're set up better for winning on this one or that one, but still, that that uncertainty makes the upfront decision making again really really hard, and and makes observation an appealing choice uh, at least initially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and maybe I got a little ahead of myself with um, with my first question. Can you talk a little bit about what the hearing preservation options are um, as far as surgery and do are there hearing preservation options, you know, with radio surgery? When we talk about radio surgery, what happens with hearing there as well? So, you know, in general, I guess when you look at the literature of radio surgery, just to touch about that a little bit, because we often, so there are places across the country and across the world that offer radio surgery up front for tumors smaller than 1.5 centimeters, mm -hmm. leaving that, especially in patients with really, really good hearing, that they prevent hearing loss with them. The literature supports that you're, you're like, it's likely to accelerate some of that hearing loss. Um, although that's not definitive, we don't have huge groups of patients to, to demonstrate that, but at least we believe that it actually increases the hearing loss from that, from that treatment in most cases. For surgery, there's a, there's a couple of ways to go about hearing preservation surgery, um, depending on the configuration of the tumor. And some people do one more commonly than the other, and, uh, but I think a lot of places try to tailor the two approaches that would be best for that particular tumor because not all tumors are alike. So in general, very small tumors confined to the IAC or the bony canal um, that are on the upper nerve, so superior vestibular nerve, are well approached by an uh, approach called the middle fossa approach. And again, all these are done with neurosurgery and ENT. And that's mm. an approach where we come from above, make a small bony window our uh, ENT colleagues drill out the canal itself and we look down on that tumor. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the times the seventh nerve is kind of draped over the tumor there and it's a little bit more in jeopardy than the other approach. And the other approach uh, can be done for larger tumors um, uh, and, and small tumors, a retrosigmoid approach that we come from behind the ear like we normally do for large tumors, but we don't drill out the hearing structures or the balance structures um, and some of us, so I like to use an endoscope to augment that. I don't use it for the most of the resection. Sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. And some people don't believe in that. They just believe and feel. But both are really good approaches. And depending on the tumor type, I think most people now are tailoring them to what the tumor is. People can be pretty passionate about the uh, surgical choice, about the approach choice. And um uh, I think it is helpful to be facile in both approaches and then apply that, the approach that is most likely in your hands gonna give the best result rather than be uh, beholden to one or the other. Uh, they, they both come with their, our, their advantages as Dr. Van Gumpel said. And mm -hmm. um, I don't think from a patient standpoint, um, you should worry too much about the approach uh, because the surgeon ultimately needs to use the approach that is best for them mm -hmm. at, at achieving the goal. That's then, interesting because we do have a lot of questions. In fact, we have one now about, you know, is one better with, um, with middle fossa versus the retrosigmoid? Is one better for hearing preservation? Does one, you know, you mentioned the seventh nerve, which is the facial nerve. So um, does one offer a better view there? And um, does one end up, do patients end up with more headaches or more facial issues or with one or the other? So we do yeah. hear a lot. Yeah. So, and those are, they're all good questions. Mm -hmm. And I think when we're sitting down talking to a patient about their specific tumor, there's a lot of things we look at. Um, it, it, the, we'll talk about a small tumor in that bony inner ear canal, right? Mm -hmm. Well, not all small tumors in that space are the same. Mm -hmm. so, so is it on the top nerve, the superior nerve, Dr. Van Gumpel is measuring? Is it on the bottom nerve? Is it out towards the base of the inner ear? Is it, is it the other direction? When we look from the retrosigmoid standpoint, is the balance system in our way or not? Are we gonna be able to expose the tumor well or not? And so all those little subtle anatomic variations make a big difference to how we look at each individual tumor and make a determination about the best surgical approach. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Do you want to talk about the recovery a little bit at all? Dr. Yeah, Van that Gumpel, was a question or, that just yeah. came in about, a, about the recovery of, uh, uh, between the two is, does one offer a better recovery or an easier recovery, I guess? Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think so. The recovery in these tumors has a lot to do with how much you're 
balance is present preoperatively and how much balance you lose with the surgery. Of course, the, the tumor comes from the balanced nerve. Of course, really small tumors where we're dissecting them just off the nerve. And I think that's probably the biggest indicator of how successful we're going to be. When you look at, you know, all this literature about this, or even our own series here, we know we're really good at, at uh, we can get up in the 70 and 80 percentile range for, for hearing preservation for five or four millimeter tumors. Um, if that's what we're operated on. Now, we don't operate on those that frequently anymore. But if we injure the balance apparatus or take the nerve that comes with it, um, the patients, they just have the typical recovery that they have with these things. It takes them a long time to get over that. The headaches are different between the two. Neither of the approaches that we're aware of offers a higher chance of having post-operative headaches. The headaches are pretty similar between the two. The risks of a stroke um, for either is very similar, especially for smaller tumors. I think there's very good, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's, they're pretty similar in terms of recovery. I will say there's a little bit more risk on the left side doing a middle fossa approach for this. Mm -hmm. uh, so some people lean towards retrosig for that particular side, but for the smaller tumors, at least, um, there's still a pretty low risk of complications with those. I think I, I can probably speak for both of us. It's interesting that we, we do exactly the same operation on, you know, 50 different people, and you will see a, a complete range of different recoveries. People that have almost no pain and bounce back really fast, and then people mm -hmm. that just have tons of headache and and um, and have a more prolonged recovery. And again, mm -hmm. every. It's just how our bodies are. They're un mm -hmm. unpredictable how they react to, to similar surgeries. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about what your experience has been with patients who do end up with complete hearing loss on one side, so they're single-sided deaf, and how, um, how you might prepare them a little bit for that? Because we've had several patients, um, we had a support group leader recently, and then um, other patients say that that was really... Um, more difficult to deal with than they thought it might be. And so um, we've been talking a lot on our end about how we can offer patients resources that might help them some, help them prepare themselves a little bit better. Um, how do you talk to patients about that? Yeah, I think it is a hard thing to prepare for and people underestimate the importance of hearing in an ear. I mean, mm -hmm. I hear a lot, well, I don't care about my hearing. Um, I just want my face to work yes. normally. Mm -hmm. And they do care about their hearing. Um, and they, there's two main problems people have if you lose hearing in an ear, the sound localization ability, mm -hmm. uh, which I think most people adapt to fairly well. And then hearing in background noise or hearing in noisier environments and processing sound that way is much harder. And that tends to be the thing that's really problematic. Um, Single-sided deafness is really common. I, we see t I see patients week in, week out, everything's fine. And in, in five seconds, they lose hearing in an ear and mm -hmm. they usually summer all of it and it doesn't come back. Some you know, inflammatory or vascular process. And uh, so it's much more common than people recognize. And you can't tell looking at somebody if they have single-sided deafness. I don't think there's a way to really mimic it, prepare for it or understand it. And again, it's in part, there's variable outcomes. So not everybody who loses hearing in an ear actually struggles all that much. Some mm -hmm. people adapt, they'll tell us later, you know what, I really do just fine. I don't mm -hmm. feel like I need to do anything. And other people, they're struggling resuming their normal day-to-day -day lives. Again, it's that how did the brain adapt in this particular person? And if I may add to what, what uh, Dr. Driscoll is saying is we see this with all forms of neurologic loss in neurosurgery. So whether it's losing hearing, eyesight, or cord injuries, is we see people really have a hard time with all of those issues right up front. But most people at a year or two out have adapted really well and don't think about it as much and actually are, are, are very happy regardless of their neurologic deficit. Mm -hmm. I will say, though, that, um, you know, there's a lot of centers out there that don't uh, that don't necessarily try to save hearing as, as frequently, I would say, as, as some centers. Um, and this is gets down to this discussion. You know, we're talking about small tumors earlier. There's another discussion within hearing preservation is 
you know, trans lab versus a retro SIG discussion when someone has, you know, marginal hearing. So hearing well enough that can be, re can be helped with the hearing aid, you know, everyone might just say for a two centimeter tumor, well, let's just go through the ear and we'll, you're, you'll, you'll lose your hearing because it's unlikely we'll be able to keep your hearing. Um, but in some patients, it's certainly worth still trying to save that hearing and actually is still important to that patient for you to try to save that hearing. So there's a lot of different ways to attack hearing preservation surgery. But in larger tumors, even though we don't see that very frequently, it turns out when we get in there, it has a lot to do with how the nerves lay out. And we can save hearing sometimes in very large tumors, in fact. Yeah, and I think we've always, it's hard to take the hearing. So I'd rather give it a shot. If there's some reasonable hearing, let's try to save it because I don't think there's a, a real price to pay. Mm -hmm. uh, people, again, make a lot of distinctions between retrosigmoid and translabyrinthine approaches and outcomes and more headache or less headache, more facial nerve risk or not. And I, I don't think for us, that's really been our experience. And, and at the end of the day, no matter what approach you take, you're getting to the same tumor. Mm -hmm. It's the same tumor around the same nerves. And so the outcomes really shouldn't be all that different. Uh, mm -hmm. So if somebody has decent hearing, even if they have a big tumor, uh, we're going to try and save that hearing. So if that's the case, if they have decent hearing, but, and, and they, um, they have a big tumor though, would, would you then do like a hearing, you would only do consider then the middle fossa or the retrosigmoid is trans labyrinthine. Does that offer hearing preservation? If you get in there and see that you're able to save it, is that possible? Can't save hearing with trans labyrinthine. So. Okay. Yeah, but, and, and I don't want to make it sound like every big tumor we're going to try and save hearing. I mean, there's mm -hmm. some big tumors. It's, yeah. it's, we're not going to save the hearing. Mm -hmm. it, our, our general approach has been to use retrosigmoid for the very large tumors. It's exactly opposite of some others who like to use a trans labyrinthine mm -hmm. approach. But again, I think we look at the particular tumor, the anatomy of the patient, the vas the venous system. What do we think is the, the best approach for this particular person with this particular tumor. It, and I don't think we're dictatorial or, or paternal about these things. We have okay. these open discussions. That's why when Dr. Driscoll and I, or Dr. Carlson and I, or Dr. Neff and I meet a patient, sometimes these conversations go for an hour mm -hmm. because some patients have seen three other surgeons and say, you know what? I know that it's low, low chance I can save my hearing, but it's important to me and I'd like someone to try. And I think that makes a lot of sense to try to do that. I mean, that happens and those people can have hearing preservation. I mean, I think we're very blunt with them that we don't think that, um, you know, in some circumstances we may say it's less than 5% or even lower than that. But like Dr. Driscoll says, I think what our job as uh, surgeons is to educate the patient about the anatomy that may make a trans labyrinthine approach more favorable over a retrosig or something like that and talk about what those risks and benefits are and have the patient really make the decision about what is important to them and what they value, because ultimately they're the ones that have to live with that decision. Okay. Um, let's address one of these questions here that's in the, in the box about the one that's the, what, what is the mechanism of hearing loss if during surgery, no visible damage is seen to the nerve? Because I have another one that's similar where um, somebody asks how, why do you lose hearing after treatment, if there's no risk current. So if you do preserve hearing, and I know these are two separate questions, sorry, <laughs> but if you do preserve hearing, um, why then sometimes does it deteriorate or go away completely if there's no recurrence of the tumor? Uh, you know, Colin's a hearing expert and I'm not, but um, you know, <laughs> some sometimes, you know, people lose hearing without surgery as well. So why mm -hmm. do why do people have presbycusis and age-related hearing loss, or why do people have genetic-related causes for this? I mean, so some, we can't answer all those situations, but probably in patients that we preserve and there's no tumor recurrence, there's probably some other mechanism causing that. I mean, I don't know if that's a fair assessment, Dr. Driscoll, or what you think, but. Yeah, that's, I, I think those are interesting questions. Um, yeah, I'd really like to know why when we feel like we take a tumor out, it comes away from the auditory nerve beautifully, it looks perfect, and the nerve doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, it's, 
Interesting. Uh, and sensory nerves are very different from motor nerves. So the facial nerve moves muscles. It's a motor nerve. The hearing nerve has a really complicated job. It doesn't just communicate a very simple electrical message down the auditory nerve. It has to work in perfect synchrony or people don't have good hearing. Mm -hmm. And so it has a very different job and it's, it just tends to be very fragile that way. The other thing, uh, the other reason we think we lose hearing in people is a vascular problem. So there's one little tiny artery in most patients that supplies the inner ear. And if you get even temporary spasm of that artery for a few minutes, you can permanently lose the hearing in the ear. The hearing organ is a, is a very, very uh, fragile and fickle structure. Uh, so it's easy to lose the hearing. It's harder to know exactly what happens in people where, let's say we save the hearing and a month later it deteriorates um, or three months later it deteriorates. We take out tumors, we're cutting the balance nerve fibers that the tumor is coming from, we're causing some trauma, there's maybe some potent, you know, potential for just ongoing degeneration and fluid changes and proteins and things in your inner ear that are all uh, increase the risk of, of loss. But I think we don't really know exactly what happens with delayed hearing loss. Okay. Um, Dr. Van Guppel, you mentioned earlier um, sometimes when the tumor is on the left side, uh, surgeons will choose one um, technique over the other because there might be a little, somebody asked about um, potentially the, um, wondered if there were more cognitive risks in the middle fossa versus the retrosigmoid since um, there is more retraction of the cerebellum in um, the middle fossa approach. So does that have anything to do with the side and is that true? I think in general, we see um, more, at least transient language, post-operative language issues and cognitive issues with prolonged re uh, retraction of the left temporal lobe. Now that's more common when we're inside of the brain, re retracting the cerebrum. Mm -hmm. here, here we're extra dural, so outside of the brain, looking down on nerves, but there is still some risk with it. And the other um, risk that we have is we're working around some of the venous structures, even outside of the brain on that side. And there's some increased risk with some um, of having a stroke on that side. Now, that doesn't mean if, if the middle fossa approach is the right approach for the left side, we still do that. And mm -hmm. we talk about that. The risk isn't huge or different. But if there's e if there's equality between retrosig and, and uh, middle fossa on the left side, I think a lot of people would still probably favor more of the retrosig than that because of the, the reduction in risk of con those complications. Okay. Um, we had one of our first questions was about cochlear implants and we've had a couple since then on our Facebook page. Um, so one, I guess would be, it's only a recent, um, recently been allowed by the FDA for um, single-sided deafness. So um, how common are they in acoustic neuroma patients? And um, um, how common are you, or are you seeing patients where you take out the tumor and have an, um, a cochlear implant put in at the same time? Yeah, so there is another session on hearing restoration. Yes. And, and you can probably tell the audience when that one is. And I don't want to, yeah, they're going to cover this in a lot more detail, but I would say cochlear implantation has completely changed the paradigm for management of patients that have tumors in both ears. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is changing things in single-sided deafness. But remember, there's one thing you need for a cochlear implant to work, and that's an, a hearing nerve that'll carry a signal. Mm -hmm. So that nerve has to run from the cochlea to the brain. And if when we take out the tumor or treat the tumor, if we injure that nerve enough, it may not work. So in some of the patients where, who have had surgery, even if we as surgeons think we've saved the nerve, it, it won't always work um, in those situations. So it's a bit more complicated, but it is an option. And it, we can often get quite good hearing results um, if there's a good nerve there. It's usually a, applicable in people that have had uh, small tumors. Okay. Um, it's also, I mean, I'll just say it can also be, sorry, it can also be 
uh, used to people that have not had, or <laughs> Jamie's laughing at me. Um, <laughs> I can't help it. I'm, I'm a hearing guy. I got to talk about hearing. Um, the, uh, we, we sometimes put cochlear implants in people who have vestibular schwannoma that's not been treated, mm -hmm. it's not growing or is growing very slowly and it can, it'll work. We put them in people that have had their tumors treated with radiation because that nerve is still there, even though they don't have hearing, it, we can still often drive a signal uh, down the hearing nerve. So it, it's gained an increasing role in restoring or preserve, protecting hearing and, and people with vestibular schwannoma. Okay. There is, um, there, there is also, I'm sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> um, there's also a very small experience right now, and they're probably going to talk about this in that same talk uh, mm -hmm. that Dr. Driscoll mentioned, of uh, patients that where we put the, the CI electrode in while we remove the tumor. And it's very sensitive, at least, at least in my limited experience, we've done it twice now, in a monitoring the nerve and making sure it has integrity, uh, integrity during that case. Um, so there, there will be new treatment options with this. We just, we're just kind of figuring out what those limits are at this point in time. Okay. And that, um, hearing restoration talk will be tomorrow, um, at 12 noon Eastern. So 11 for, for you guys and nine o'clock on the West coast. So, um, let us talk about, um, hearing preservation long-term. There's a question about um, what are you seeing for the length of time maintain, maintaining whatever level of hearing you come out of treatment with? Are you seeing that then for five years, 10 years, long-term? What are the statistics kind of there? I, so there's not a huge amount of data with really long-term follow-up, but mm -hmm. I think it's safe to say that if we save good hearing and you get through that first number of months or a year, and you have no recurrence, then you're likely to hang on to useful hearing for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. okay. um, oh, this was a good question. Does, um, does the longer you we hear about tumors being sticky, especially to the facial nerve? And so this question was, if you watch and wait for a while, does that, does the tumor being in there longer make it more sticky, more difficult to remove, anything like that? I, I think we don't know if it does or not. I don't know that. I know that talk is very commonly used when we say that we're going to, or after someone's received radiation, or get uh, mm -hmm. stereotactic radiation for it. Uh, we do see that with some tumors, the longer they're there, they're able to develop more vascular supply. We, I don't think that's necessarily with the case with these tumors. We don't know how long most of them have been there before we operate on them anyway. So to say in a particular individual that a year or two of watchful waiting and maybe a subtle decline in their hearing is going to increase the difficulty for us, I, I, I think it's unlikely that it does, unless it's a growing tumor, right? So there's probably some increased risk with a, with a growing tumor. But I don't think that they're... Uh, going to be more sticky by sitting there an extra year in most circumstances. Okay. And when you're talking with patients about um, about how they want to proceed, what what factors should they consider? Like there was a question about does the shape of the tumor make a difference um, as far as hearing preservation? So what other factors are there that you are talking to patients about when you are determining whether or not to move forward with hearing preservation surgery? I think the size is probably the biggest one. So if someone's really interested in, in uh, hearing preservation surgery, I think uh, smaller tumors we're going to be more successful at. And we know that the, there's a substantial drop off over a centimeter. So if a tumor is over a centimeter, um, in terms, and we know that we're very good at preserving hearing with very small tumors, three or four millimeters. And one would ask why we operate on them sometimes. Well, that's one of the factors for patients is some patients don't want a tumor in their head or want it out. Yeah. And I think that's a very reasonable approach that they don't want to come into the office, you know, at three months, one year, one year, two years, two years, and, and worry about that tumor growing because with taking it out, there's still a chance that it could recur, but it's, it's much smaller than watching it. Um, the other things that are very helpful uh, in terms of what we would help us decide if we should watch a tumor or, or, or encourage hearing preservation surgery, if that tumor is way out on the nerve and pushing against, 
the where the cochlea comes out. So we call them distally impacted. That makes it very difficult for us to A, see the tumor. And it makes it difficult for us to preserve hearing, specifically in that uh, situation. So that's called a fundal cap. So cisternal tumors seem to be a little bit better for um, hearing preservation. So those are tumors that are not in the, the, the bony canal, but out into where the right by the brainstem, especially smaller ones. Mm -hmm. um, like Dr. Driscoll said earlier, there's a superior vestibular nerve and inferior vestibular nerve. So at least with middle fossa approaches, middle uh, superior vestibular nerve is, is more successful than inferior vestibular nerve with hearing preservation. I'm sure there's some others that I'm missing, Callum. What do you think? Well, it, it goes back to, yeah, all those different factors that we look at, uh, what's going to make us successful. I think the harder, so one of the harder things is everybody's, it, decision-making is difficult. What choosing what to do, do I do nothing? Do I have surgery? Do I have radiation? What's the timing of that? What are my outcomes going to be? And basically you just spin in circles, trying to do the analysis. And if, if you feel like if I just had the right data, I could make a logical decision. And it turns out there is no logical decision. There is no actual algorithm that anybody can come up with. And it's, bec it's because of all the things we, that are unpredictable and that we don't know how to quantify. So you asked the question about, well, uh, how, do we, you know, how do we understand as a patient, what is it like for me to have unilateral hearing loss? Nobody has any idea what it's like. And nobody mm -hmm. has any idea what it's like going to be like in them, even though other people can say, well, here's what it was like for me. Mm -hmm. Nobody can really understand what it's like to have some mild facial weakness or a dry eye. And so you can't really make a nice logical decision. And so then there's this danger of latching on to one thing to help guide you to the right decision. And hearing often becomes, for a lot of people, becomes that one thing. And I don't think that, I think we have to be careful about that because then it leads you to do something that maybe in gut isn't the right thing to do. And hearing is such a fickle thing. Um, we can't win all the time. So I, I look at hearing as it's sort of the icing on the cake. And, uh, you know, if you, the cherry on top or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, if you can have that at the end of your vestibular schwannoma journey, you're in a select group of people because the vast majority don't have it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, our job is to really help sort through these really nitty gritty details with people, I think, to help them make what is the right choice for them and be the guardians of reality about what's achievable, what's not achievable, what, what's achievable for lots of people, but unpredictable. Right. Um, and in this particular case, you know, I don't know if we're going to win or not. And so I, I find it complicated and, um, and I think we all find it complicated and we do this all the time, all the time. And we've seen thousands of people go through the decision-making process and, mm -hmm. and try to help people make a good decision. And, uh, and the hearing is, is central to a lot of those discussions. Well, I think it's incredibly difficult for patients. I think um, in one sense, they, you know, the ones who have, some choice in how they proceed, um, I'm sure are, are in a sense grateful for that. But then at the same time, all of that information and all of those factors and all of those different outcomes and all of the different things that can happen is it tends to be overwhelming. And I'm sure you experience the same thing with patients, but that's what we hear from patients over and over and over again. And yeah. so just, you know, they don't deal with it every day. And so it's, I think you're exactly right. They just you know, kind of, and that's, that's, so we're you know, really I, just trying to provide that information. Part of our job is to provide information, but it's not just to provide information, right? That, that's, we try to lay the foundation of the important, the, the important factors, the things that are actually going to drive decision-making. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then, yeah. you know, get everybody kind of on the same page. Um, mm -hmm. But then ultimately our job is to give you advice about what we think is right for you to do. Mm -hmm. And for that, we need to know your priorities. Mm 
Yes. We need to get to know you well enough to feel like we can help you make that right decision for you. And that's a hard part. Um, it's one of the downsides of telehealth, I, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I love some telehealth things, but it's a different conversation that we have. And the ultimate decision in the kind of cases we're talking about, smaller tumors, good hearing, that's a conversation that requires time. And it requires uh, an emotional connection and understanding. Mm -hmm. And I, that, for me, is harder to do over a Zoom. You know, if you have a, a big tumor, there's no controversy about what to do. You have a tiny tumor, there really shouldn't be any controversy about what to do. But for the other ones, I think the face-to-face -face visits are, are important for understanding what, what the, you know, the emotions. Mm -hmm. The, the other part of our job, you know, Colin, as you kind of were not alluding to, but it built off your point as well as what Melissa was saying is that there's also a lot of misinformation on the internet about these things and clarifying, you know, some people coming in and, you know, what, what happens with a larger tumor and a smaller tumor and how that, how they fit into it. I think it's really critical to not think that everybody, like you said, I love how you said their acoustic neuroma journey, how everybody's is different. And that there's a lot of factors that they probably they need an expert to weigh in. You're not going to find all this on the internet mm -hmm. because you need somebody that's seen thousands of these to sit down and say, put it into context for you because you don't have all the details for every patient out there. You know, even a one centimeter tumor is very different if it's very far out in the canal or next to the brainstem. Right. So those things are little things where there might be big differences in what other comorbidities a, person, a patient has. If there's, you know, 69 with a hemoglobin A1C of, of 11, you know, that may change things quite a bit when they have severe other comorbidities for us. So I think it's really critical to sit down and get those opinions. And as Colin, as Colin said, you know, the telehealth thing has not been a slam dunk. People are getting, you know, 10 opinions. And I think it's creating more, um, it's, it's making it harder for them to make a decision because they're getting exactly what he said, advice from people that see it very differently. It kind of gets back to our first conversation with these tumors. We can flash the same tumor up at a national conference and we love to do this. And 50% of the surgeons might go one way and 50% of the surgeons go the other way. And what you don't want to do is the people that go to the left, you want to go to the, to a different surgeon and say, well, I want you to do this other approach on me because I really like you. You want them to do what they think is best for you and what they believe in and what you believe they can do for you. That's a great point. Um, I've sat through some of those, um, those kinds of conferences and it's interesting to listen to different surgeons talk about this because they, they do have very different opinions and different centers come at it differently. And, and it's not wrong, but it is where their expertise lies, it seems. So um, we advise patients to get, to get multiple opinions only to try to hear from people who are substantially experienced in whatever treatment option they think where their doctor thinks is best for them. So um, we have a couple more questions coming in. Um, we had a question about, um, why do vestibular schwannomas grow? And you know, some of them don't. So why do some of them grow and some of them don't? Do you have any idea? Yeah, there's the Nobel Prize <laughs> for vestibular schwannoma research. Uh, yeah, we, I mean, the short answer to that is we don't know. Um, mm -hmm. We can't predict in today's world when we look at an MRI, which tumor is gonna grow or not. And it's personally, one of the reasons I like a period of observation, because some tumors grow really rapidly. It's mm -hmm. rare, but they grow really rapidly. And, I, and those tumors, we don't think respond as well to radiation. And so we should take those tumors out. Some tumors don't grow at all. I literally, I, I, I love at the meetings. You can put up an image and say, well, what would you do? And, you know, some people are like, oh, we should radiate that tumor. We should take that tumor out. We should follow it. And then I show the next one, the next image. Just 10 years later, the tumors are identical. Mm -hmm. Well, did you, you know, <laughs> that person didn't need anything done. Mm -hmm. They're completely stable. Mm -hmm. uh, so we so don't know um, what to do. There's, you know, with some excitement for a little bit about aspirin and maybe that would stabilize tumors. I, I don't know if that's true, but I guess I'm a little bit skeptical that that'll ever pan out. And mm -hmm. I do hold out hope that um, MRI scanning uh, continues to evolve a lot. 
there's a lot of data in MRI scans that maybe um, the algorithms can figure out some difference or we can get some bio, biochemical data or information that helps us identify tumors that are going to grow or not grow. You know, Colin, maybe more pertinent to this talk is how do, why is it that we see tumors that never grow yet the hearing goes away, right? Yeah. And that's even probably more perplexing. We don't understand that either. Mm -hmm. We don't understand why patients, when these tumors are growing, you know, it makes a lot of sense that there's some compression causing the hearing loss. But when tumors don't grow at all, people still lose hearing, which is really confusing to us too. And we don't understand that completely. Yeah. And you can see that on the MRI scans where we'll see changes in the fluid of the cochlea mm -hmm. in the inner ear. And there's a sense among a lot of us that are, you see those changes that person's hearings at higher risk. And, you know, that's maybe another factor we should bring into play. Well, <clears throat> It looks like your hearing's at some risk. Maybe we should take the chance at saving your hearing now with you know, with tumor removal. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are a lot of unknowns. Yeah. Um, we have a couple questions about, we have one question that came in early about um, protecting the hearing in the in your better hearing ear so that you don't end up with complete hearing impairment. And then another question just came in um, about protecting the hearing the year where you have hearing loss, but it's not complete. And trying to, do you protect it by using earplugs or do you, um, is it better to expose it to noise? Does that, does it make a difference in that case? I'm not entirely sure what the first person was getting at about the, the opposite ear, whether they were worried about losing the hearing during the surgery or the recovery. Mm -hmm. um, it's exceedingly rare. So yeah. it's other side of the head. Um, there are very rare cases where people have lost hearing in the other ear, uh, but that's exceedingly rare. And there's nothing I don't think we can do to really predict or protect. We do give mm -hmm. steroids during surgery that's protective. Um, I think the later hearing loss, it's all about noise exposure and hearing protection. So mm -hmm. it, it, and it's no different than any of us on this call, frankly, we should right. all do the same thing of, of protect our ears. Um, so if you are in using power tools or a loud vacuum, um, wear your, wear your ear protection. Okay. Um, let's see. We have, let's see. Um, we do have a lot of questions, a couple questions also on, um, Facebook, um, about radiation. And um, what can be expected with hearing long term with radiation, which we touched on a little bit. Um, but are is there um, if hearing is preserved after radiation, does it? I think you already talked about the fact that it tends to deteriorate after that. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, um, we see people with really really good hearing, class A hearing, have hearing at ten years of about thirty percent. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's known as to whether or not there's a continued decline because it hasn't been studied after that. Um, and we don't really understand the mechanism of why that hearing loss occurs in gamma knife or, or other forms of stereotactic radio surgery either. Some people think that the radiation hurts the cochlea. Some people think it directly hurts the nerve, but <clears throat> we don't understand it completely. Um, but it's uh, there are a certain percentage of patients that that do preserve it long term though, mm -hmm. and we so yeah, this I think this is also confusing to some patients when we watch tumors, and they start to grow, and then we say well you know you have class A hearing or really good hearing, and then we say now we really think you should have it gamma knifed, because what we're doing is we're saying you know I'm not sure which will be better for your hearing long term but we think stopping the tumor from growing will preserve your hearing longer than the exposure to the, to the radio surgery, which I think some people get caught up on a little bit, but that's what our presumption is there. Sure. Okay. Well, I think we've covered just about everything um, in this session. So I really appreciate you both being here. I think what we'll do is we have a few minutes, about eight minutes before we're supposed to get started on the next one. So um, if 
as an attendee, you want to just kind of hang out. I'll um, just share my screen and I'll have some slides running, but um, we'll get started right at, it'll be 6.30 Eastern time, 5.30 Central, and then 3.30 on the West Coast. Um, we'll go ahead and get started then. Dr. Driscoll will continue to join us, and then we'll add um, Dr. Weisskopf, Dr. Link, and Dr. Carlson. So, um, and we'll just have another kind of Q&A session. So if you want to hang on for that, you are welcome to. Dr. Van Gumpel, thank you so much for taking the time and Dr. Driscoll as well, you too. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, thank you so much, Melissa, for having us. We really appreciate it. It's been great. Thank you very much. Good luck with right. the next session. Thank you.